from a scalability perspective, anything that's worth doing takes time. I know that's a cliche, but it takes time to get something done. What's exciting right now is that we're finally seeing a lot of the momentum to get there. Hi, I'm Mia Quinn, host of Sustainably Speaking. If you've listened to the show before, you probably know what advanced recycling is, but who are the people and companies behind this technology and how did it come about? Joining me from South by Southwest in Austin, Texas is Jeremy De Benedictus. He's the president of Altera, a company working to keep used plastics out of landfills. Jeremy, it's so fun to be here in Austin with you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Okay, before we get into the meat of this, let's start off with a lightning round. I'm gonna ask a question, you have 10 seconds to answer. Ready? Sounds like a game I play with my daughter, but go ahead. <laughs> your favorite city? Akron, Ohio. What could you eat every day for the rest of your life? Ooh, ice cream. Dream vacation? Anywhere where it's warm and sunny and there's sand. What's the last song you listened to? Probably was my son's favorite song, which is the Hulk Hogan theme song. I'm a real American. Guilty pleasure? Hmm, having a bourbon every once in a while. Best mistake you ever made? Joining Altera and figuring out how to be an entrepreneur. Wow, great, great runway there to let's talk about. How was that the best mistake you ever made? When I joined, it was really to leave a large organization where you're a cog in the machine, you're a piece of the puzzle, but I always felt like there was something else. And so this entrepreneurial itch hit me in 2010 and I needed to scratch it. So I started really scouting some of the technology and smaller businesses in the Northeast Ohio area. My uncle, who's an investment banker out of Chicago, was over visiting me once and said, hey, there's this technology in your backyard in Akron, Ohio, you should check this out. And I did. I joined to be an entrepreneur. I joined to bet on myself, take a chance, take a risk. There was no salary. but No salary. There was no salary at the time. It's what true sweat equity and entrepreneurship is. So I always say I have the most patient, kind, understanding wife that anyone could ever imagine. So we were living off of what she was bringing in. We had young kids at the time. So if you're gonna be not sure, doing it when you're younger because your kids don't know the difference. And so we started making sacrifices like that. But the one thing I did promise everyone is we won't change the quality of life from what we were used to at that time. And when the kids are littler, they have simpler things that they wanna go do. But very quickly after being an entrepreneur for a couple months, you know, I found myself visiting landfills, visiting the local MRFs, recycling centers in the area. Start to see what we're doing to the environment, right? People take for granted that when you put your trash and recyclables out to the curb, it just goes away, just disappears. And back then in 2010, 2011, I mean, we recycled paper and, and cardboard, but that's about all we did. So really quickly after kind of going through that period of visiting those places, became an environmentalist. You know, at the time my kids were young and they were watching Wally -E all the time. And I always say, you know, we don't want to end up where you need Wallies to bail us out because of the bad choices we made. So you went to Altera knowing that you were going to make a difference in the environment. Altera at the end of the day is a plastic circularity enabler. We have a disruptive technology that can break down hard to recycle plastics into the building blocks to make new plastics. So we're basically breaking them down into the valuable parts that they have, selling those to downstream customers who will convert it back into new plastics to make new things. And by doing that, we've created value. So we pay for our raw material. Our raw material is discarded plastics. We're paying someone for that. When you pay someone something, they're incentivized to care about it. And so it's not like we're getting paid to take in trash. We're paying them, so they're picking out the great stuff for us. And who's they? They would be uh, material reclamation facilities, recycling centers. Your curbside recycling goes somewhere. They're taking out all the things that they have a market for in that region. There's things that go in there that people are wish cycling, or it's contamination, or it's those films that we were talking about. And those items then end up in a residue stream and then end up with us. So people are putting stuff in their recycling like that they think should maybe be recycled, but actually mechanical recyclers can't do it. Like film, we're talking about like the overwrap for your toilet paper and paper towel, everything from that to your salad bags, to your dry cleaning bags. What other things like that are going into the bin that these traditional mechanical recyclers can't process right now? Yeah, it varies by jurisdiction. There's over 9,000 different recycling jurisdictions in the US, so it varies highly. But on a national average, only 1% 
of flexible materials, over wraps, or even your household products like your deodorant container, your toothpaste roll, the pump that you might be spraying your hair with hairspray. There's a lot of different plastics that are put together to make that. And then there's some metals that are in there as well. And a mechanical recycler is not gonna be able to take that, sort it, and just simply convert it into something that can be reused to make new products. But you can, and so they're sending that stuff to you. We can, we're seeing it starting to happen right now where the material reclamation facilities know that they've got some valuable product, they know we'll pay for it, so there's an end market that's been established. They're putting in the investment and the equipment to pick that material out of the waste stream so that we can then process it. This all sounds amazing and too good to be true, right? So some of the newer recycling technologies like yours, we hear like NGOs saying, well, no, that's not okay, or it's not working, or it's not real. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I think first we need to do is bifurcate what I think they're complaining about and what we actually do. So there are some companies out there who do waste to energy, and that's still a linear model where you're taking plastics and other materials, you're creating a gas, and then you're burning that gas, or you're creating electricity from that gas. So that is the linear model. It's not getting back into a new product to be remade. What we're doing is liquefying it into those building blocks that can then ship as a product to a chemical company or plastics manufacturer to make into new products. From a scalability perspective, anything that's worth doing takes time. I know that's a cliche, but it takes time to get something done. I always look back 15 years to where Tesla was, and they did 974 cars 15 years ago. And it was a horrible US auto market at the time, so the US market was only 12 million cars. But that's where we're at right now. We're doing 70,000 barrels of product into a large US market, but that percent that we're doing is the same that Tesla was doing 15 years ago into the overall US auto market. And they scaled. And they did it. Humanity can solve any problem. It just takes people, time, and money. And so we've got to put all three of those things together. What's exciting right now is that we're finally seeing a lot of the momentum to get there. People are talking about it. No one was talking about this in 2011 when we were working on it. No one was talking about it even five years ago. And now, not only are we talking about it, we're debating on it. We've got good comments and bad comments. I got people calling me out on LinkedIn now. I think those are all good things because it's part of the conversation now. Now it's important to educate people of what the facts are versus what the opinions are. When you say liquefying, does liquefying mean burning? What does that mean? Are you burning stuff? We are not. So liquefying, it's a phase change separation. Sounds scary. But a phase change separation is no different than how I taught it to my five-year-old daughter when we were working out of the garage on this technology to begin with. Imagine you have some water and you put some salt and sand in it, and then I freeze that. Now I've got a frozen ice cube. I'm gonna melt that on a pan. So I'm indirectly heating it, and I melt that ice cube. You melted it, but you didn't burn it. Correct. You just heated it up a little. We heated it up. So it's indirectly heated. It's like melting the ice cube on the stove you heat it, it turns into a liquid. You heat it a little bit more, it turns into a vapor, and then you can condense it. The important thing is that what was left in that pot on the stove was the salt and the sand that we put into the water to start with. So in plastics case, there's dyes and inks and fillers that are used to get the properties or the colors that people are looking for in their packaging. So we heat it up, it turns into a liquid. You heat it some more, it turns into a vapor. The dyes, inks, and fillers remain. And the important thing that's valuable are the hydrocarbons. Those are the building blocks to make new plastics. We condense those into a liquid. We are in the business of preserving molecules because remember, we pay for discarded plastics. So if I'm paying you for discarded plastic, and then I've got expenses, people, utilities, equipment cost to actually process it, I have to sell a product. We want to preserve every molecule we can into a liquid product to make new plastics. If we were just simply burning it, then it would be the waste to energy model where we're getting paid to take those materials and the business models around incinerating them. It means making them go away. And the byproduct then is electricity. That makes a lot more sense to me. And so what is the environmental impact, I guess, that you see or that is really happening versus maybe what the perception might be? Right, so I think we really got to look at what value is the technology providing to society. And I look at it as two things. One, by creating a value for a discarded plastic, it won't end up in the landfills and it won't end up in the waterways because someone's incentivized to do something about that because it's value. It's like, 
there's not a bunch of dollar bills lying all around outside because there's value. Someone would pick it up and would do something with it. The second value to society is that for every barrel of hydrocarbon product that we create to be remade into new plastics, that's one less barrel that was drilled or fracked. That's one less barrel of virgin fossil-based material. And so then when you look at the life cycle analysis, the greenhouse gas footprint, and there's a lot of studies that are out there, but you'll see that the carbon footprint of recycling material and offsetting a barrel of virgin fossil-based material is 20 to 60 percent better. So we've got lowering carbon emissions, we're cleaning the world up by creating value, and we don't have to drill or frack as much to make new plastics. Those are all great things. When you look at the plant, we are treated just like any chemical manufacturing facility. We have an air permit. Our air permit is considered a minor source, and so therefore it's with the Ohio EPA. We get stack tested. We are utilizing natural gas as a fuel for the heating of the plastic. And so there are emissions, like any manufacturing yeah. facility. Like my kid's school, there's a water boiler. There's emissions that come from that. That air permit is monitored by the Ohio EPA, and we stack test against that. Because we make a chemical, have it registered with the US EPA. You just finished this panel at South by Southwest, keeping it out of the landfill, how to make recycling work. Tell us about it. Yeah, I think the two big items I took from just talking with the panelists, number one, it's a bunch of stats, but hear me out. Eight out of 10 people expect packaging to be recyclable and to be made from recycled content. But only four out of 10 people participate in recycling. Whether it's access to recycling or it's just they don't participate in their city's recycling plan. And only 21% of all potential recyclable goods in your house make it into the bin to get recycled. So everyone wants to do it. Only half of everyone who raises their hand to do it actually does it. And those of us who do do it, only do it half the time to get to 21%. Of that 21%, 95% of that is your easy things. Cardboard, glass, PET water bottles, pop cans, steel cans. It's not your tougher to recycle things like your snack bags and your juice pouches and stuff like that. I thought that was really interesting because I think what it comes down to is it really boils down to what do each of us decide on an individual basis every day of our lives. Every moment is a decision. You know that the PET water bottle is recyclable. You know that your city will take it, but you're busy. You're at your daughter's volleyball game. It's a 12 hour tournament day. You've got four Powerade bottles and you're not carrying them all out of the center and there's no recycling bin there. Do you throw it away or do you carry it out and put it into your recycling bin? I mean, those are decisions we make every day and it's the inconvenient truth that it's tough sometimes to do those things, to do what's right. So we've got to make it easier for people. I think making it easier for people is important, but we all have to realize that it's our choice at the end of the day. You can make something extremely easy for people and they still don't do it. So it really comes down to an individual choice. And we just need to educate people that it's important to make the right choice in order to leave the world a better place for the next generation. Anything else that came out of your panel? Yeah, the other thing I think was around end markets and how important an end market is for recyclables, whether it's cardboard, glass, paper, or plastics. And that really there are no end markets established right now for flexibles and for films. And so even if we were collecting all those materials, where's it gonna go? And that's what plastic circularity brings to it though. So for those of us who really do want to recycle more and are truly committed, what are some of the major challenges to increasing how much more plastic can get recycled? I think it all starts with education. So we need to educate people about what is recyclable and what isn't. And with 9,000 different programs, it makes it challenging. So we need to simplify it. We need to simplify it, have a national recycling policy. We need to educate people on that. And then we need to make sure that they have access to recycling things. When they say, yes, I want to recycle, we need to make sure that they have an easy, convenient way to put it at curbside to get it into the stream. I just learned today that cardboard is only 30% recycled. Yeah, I hear you because in the hotel I'm staying in, there is no recycling in the room. So how am I going to take all these bottles out of here? Like that is on me, right? I was thinking the same thing. But those are the individual choices we kind of all have to make at the end of the day. So education, more access to collection. I'm encouraged that every time we talk to someone and we tell them that you can recycle this, they get excited. So if there's passion there, it means that there's follow through. 
I'm seeing that just locally in, in my own family as I've educated them more and more about what circular plastics technologies like ours can do. They start bringing me stuff. So again, insignificant volumes, but the significance of it is my seven-year-old now gives me grief if I don't recycle something. When we're on a walk outside, he'll pick up the litter and give it to me and tell me to take it to work. So it's one generation teaching the other generation, but that younger generation is more passionate, I think, than any of us are. And so that's the follow through. They'll get it and they'll carry it through. They'll carry the torch. How do we get more of it to companies like yours? It's on everybody at this point. It's on our company to continue making the process more readily available, more efficient, which means there's more money we can pay for incoming materials, which means we've incentivized more people to do something about it. We're seeing it right now. It's on the recycling centers to add equipment, to pull out those multi-layered packages, those films, and then densify them and send them to us. And it's on local governments and regulation to incentivize people to want to do that, to educate people to want to put those things into the bins. There's a lot there. There's a lot there to unpack. The good news is there's a lot of people working on every front. What I'm most focused on is the technology. It's ensuring that we have a technology that enables value for discarded plastics that incentivize people and governments to get those plastics to us and out of the landfill. Jeremy, thank you so much. I enjoyed learning even more about your work at Altera and how it's advancing recycling. And thank you to our listeners. Thanks for tuning in. If you have more questions, if you have questions for Jeremy, we'd love to hear from you. And we'd love to hear about what you want to talk about next. I'll see you next time on Sustainably Speaking.